Wonderful. Okay, Hi. well, let's get officially started. Welcome everybody, excited to have you in class today. Today's class is all about Article Three of the Constitution and the courts. And for this class today, we're gonna ask you guys lots of questions and we love your questions. So my name is Curry Sautner. I'm the Chief Learning Officer at the National Constitution Center. And I want you to send me as many questions you have about the courts as we go through. And we're gonna be here with two amazing people today. Number one, Jeff Rosen, our President and CEO of the National Constitution Center, who will moderate this fun class. And our VIP special guest speaker is Judge Rendell. So Judge Rendell is gonna help illuminate all of the different layers of the courts <laughs> and some really cool court cases that she has been on. And we'll also talk about her work, not just on the course, but also with the Rendell Center. So we're excited about this fun packed and illuminating half an hour to understand the course at every level so much better. So without further ado, Jeff, I will turn it over to you to take over. Thank you so much, Curry, and welcome Judge Rendell. It is always such an honor to have you on our Friday class. Friends, Judge Rendell, in addition to being uh, one of the most distinguished appellate judges in the country is also one of our leading advocates for civic education. And we're so grateful to her for her great partnership with the Constitution Center and also for helping us on these Friday classes understand what judges do. So I know you'll have lots of questions for her and I can't wait to pass them along. But judge, I thought I would start with a hard question. It's hard for me and that's why I'm asking you. Uh, just this morning, the Supreme Court decided uh, an important case involving uh, uh, abortion rights, uh, which are a very controversial question that court is taking up this year. The case is called Whole Women's Health versus Jackson, and the court, by an eight to one vote, allowed what's called a pre-enforcement challenge against the Texas law that uh, bans abortions um, after six weeks to go forward. The case is so technical. As I say, you know, I'm a law professor and I, ha I have trouble explaining it. Um, and the justices divided about who could be sued. And in the end, they agreed that some defendants, executive licensing officials who have to take enforcement actions if people violate this law could be sued. But uh, several of the justices held that no one else could be sued. Can you in plain English, give our friends a broad sense of what is going on in this case and what the nature of the constitutional question is? Well, I, I'm happy you asked, but on the other hand, I've been working on an opinion all morning and I didn't even know the case had been decided, so ah, you're, you're oh, ahead of me. <laughs> oh, sorry about that. I, I shouldn't have uh, right. asked a question That's that right. we didn't talk about in advance. Yeah. Well, the, the problem with this Texas statute is it gives different people rights. I mean, almost citizen uh, arrest powers and enforcement powers. And I think, as you said, it is so technical. So a pre-enforcement challenge based upon who can sue. Uh, the difficulty is that um, when the Supreme Court addresses these technical issues, uh, the, the press and the common person believes it's deciding on the, the merits of the case. So it, it's very difficult to get into the weeds and, and understand exactly what, what is happening. But I think in this case, the issue was who can enforce, who, who is there? What, what is this, you know, what is this mechanism? Um, so I think we have to stay tuned to when the court decides the merits, uh, but they're doing these things and, and, and sometimes it's not well understood. I will say uh, when they decided uh, to not uh, enjoin the, the Texas uh, law, several months ago, um, they did make clear that they weren't ruling on the merits. But every time you have a case involving abortion, everybody's jumping to, well, you know, what are they doing and, and kind of reading the tea leaves. Uh, so I'm anxious to look at exactly what they, what they did do, but it sounds like it is technical and we need to wait for the other shoe to drop in terms of the merits. It's, it's not, you know, deciding what's actually going on with the with this abortion statute. So uh, as you said, technicalities unfortunately abound. Thank you so much for that thoughtful answer. And friends, as you hear Judge Rendell's um, judicious answer, you you understand that even Judge Rendell who, who writes these decisions and, and I'm a law professor, I, I teach some of these subjects, we can't really 
um, understand the technicalities until we've carefully read the opinion, which is a very important thing for all of you to do too, and not just to assume when you read the headlines that uh, the court has ruled one way or another. In the law, the details matter. I'm gonna ask one more question about the cases involving abortion, because they really have to do with the role of the courts in our society as a whole. And that is the question of judicial legitimacy. In the oral argument about another case involving abortion coming out of Mississippi just a few weeks ago, the Dobbs case, which is one of the most controversial cases the court has heard you know, in, in, in a very long time, the justices seem to be disagreeing about what uh, was necessary to maintain citizens' faith in the legitimacy of the court. Some justices, uh, Justice Breyer in particular in the oral argument, cited uh, the Casey decision where the court held that to overrule Roe v. Wade under fire would subvert the court's legitimacy and therefore the court should refuse to be uh, cowed by public pressure one way or another. Other justices, uh, I think Justice Alito made this point, said that the court shouldn't even think about public opinion. They should just decide based on what they think the constitution says and, and let the heavens fall. What do, what do you think about this important question of judicial legitimacy and, and how do you as the judge think about the legitimacy of the courts when you decide cases? This is so difficult, Jeff. I think the, the problem is that everybody's hanging on every word of the Supreme Court and they are looking at the court and believing that things are political. And, and that's, that's the problem. A court that is political is going to lose its legitimacy. And, and there needs to be a concern about it because it's an institution and its independence is so important. So if the court comes down one way, it's gonna be perceived as being political. And, and Justice Sotomayor said that. She, made an impassioned statement about the, the stench that would come down if Roe versus Wade was overturned. Uh, and I think the court does need to be concerned. Should it control its outcome? I mean, we are judges and it's about the law. Uh, so there needs to be a sensitivity to it, but the minute the court decides to see which way the wind is blowing and decide based upon which the way the wind is blowing, it's gonna lose its legitimacy in another way. So it's almost like a no-win proposition. I, I do believe that the Chief Justice is very concerned about the court's legitimacy and kind of on his watch, uh, he doesn't want it to be perceived as a political institution. And mind you, I'm saying perceived as. Uh, the Wall Street Journal took Justice Sotomayor to task for saying that it, it, would, it was political, but she didn't say that. She said it would be perceived by the public as political. And I think that's just a fact of life. Mm. If they come down and overturn Roe versus Wade, it is it probably is going to be perceived as a political move on the part of those more conservative leaning justices. Now, I'm sure that whatever the court does, it's going to be, there's going to be well, well reasoned under the law. But some people will say, oh, well, you know, they just found a way uh, to decide it this way, but they had an agenda. But, you know, the court ultimately is going to decide based upon the law. As we get up in the morning, judges look at, at things differently. Uh, you know, someone who's been a prosecutor is going to look at something differently from someone who's been a defense lawyer. You know, it, but it, it is a very, very difficult problem. And, very, and, and we are at a time of such heightened politicization of the other branches um, you know, when, when the courts are going to be perceived, the courts are perceived as political, um, it is dangerous to the institution. So I think the court, whatever it does, it's going to have to be really clear about the, the basis in law of what it does. That's such an important answer to, to, to be clear at a time of heightened polarization. And what you just said about given the fact that this uh, society is so polarized, it's so important for the court to maintain its neutrality is, is also crucial. The chief justice has, as you said, expressed the same sentiment. He He's said um, in public repeatedly that the way for the court not to seem political is decide, to decide cases narrowly, not to strongly favor one side or the other with broad rulings, but to converge around more technical rulings that may give a little bit to each side. Do, do you think that's a plausible approach? Yeah, and I think um, an incremental approach. Uh, there was an op-ed piece this week by someone who'd been a law clerk for Scalia and Kavanaugh 
talking about how, on these big ticket uh, uh, issues, um, the court usually acts incrementally, which as you say, is, is narrow. Keep it narrow. Don't go with a broad brush and, and outlaw things. Just go incrementally. Mm. Um, and if I had to predict, uh, I think that's, that's probably what, it's definitely what the chief would like, whether mm. it's what the justices vote for is, is, is another matter. But yeah, narrow and incremental, um, do, do, no, do no harm, if you will. Mm. Wonderful injunctions and very, very wise. It's, it's, it's our job as um, partners in, in an effort to inspire our friends and people across America to learn about civics, to, to encourage them to think about the law and the civics in, in, in nonpartisan uh, terms and not to imagine that the courts are entirely political. Um, get, you know, given the very controversial nature of this case, what do you want to say to our friends about how they should think about it. Is this not a, a normal case, for example? It's an extraordinary case, a watershed case, it's been called. Most of what judges do doesn't involve cases that are this contested, and there's much more consensus and nonpartisan agreement. Well, I, I think Roe versus Wade is a, is a difficult opinion. Um, it's been around for a, a long time. It's generally accepted. Uh, I forget the percentages that were cited in, you know, in the, the press in the last couple of weeks, um, but it does, uh, it is one of those watershed cases that finds constitutional rights. Uh, and we have with Obergefell, uh, a case that decided that gay marriage, uh, you know, approved of gay marriage as a matter of the constitution. Uh, and then these cases that are kind of on the edge of finding a constitutional right um, Griswold, the right to privacy, uh, you know, penumbra. Um, they're, they're very difficult because so many of the justices are now, and I know you listen to the argument, they're looking at the originalism. Uh, you know, was gay marriage included, uh, you know, in something the founding fathers thought about? Uh, was abortion? Uh, and, and some of the argument before the Supreme Court was talking about the fact that women did have a right to abortion back in the in the early days. But but every justice finds their way of looking at the Constitution. And I think a case like like Dobbs, uh, you're going to find a lot of people going, you know, hewing to a certain way of looking at the Constitution. Um, for Justice Breyer. He's talked about active liberty. Uh, for others, they're talking about originalism. So the case is going to come down to a lot having to do with the philosophy mm. of particular justices. And I think you're going to see that in, in the writings. The I'm sure there'll be many opinions, and you'll be able to see this. Uh, they will find these, these ways to justify, if you will, their view through the lens of the way they look at the Constitution. Um, but I think Roe you know, Ro is, it's been around, it is public, it is highly accepted. Uh, you know, I'm not saying it's right or wrong. I don't make those decisions, uh, but it is accepted in, in, as the law of the land. So to overturn it would be, would be huge from a, from a judicial standpoint. Uh Crucially important points, uh, friends, the judge just said, um, the justices will approach the case based on their constitutional philosophies, their, their approach to interpreting the constitution. Are they an originalist? They believe in active liberty. And that's why in this class, we've been so eager to help you learn the, the methodology so you can decide which ones you think are most persuasive. And that's such an important reminder. As Curry says, lots of great questions coming in in the chat box. Our friend Colin asks your views about stare decisis and precedent and says, in your view, why is stare decisis an important legal doctrine? A, how do you draw the line as to what should be overturned despite stare decisis saying otherwise? And B, how should the court view the issue of stare decisis and respecting past precedents while also recognizing that sometimes the court should overrule itself? Well, stare decisis is extremely important in our system for the consistency and the predictability of our laws. Uh, as you look around the world at different systems, uh, 
a lot of times I think the judicial system and the economics are very closely tied together. And I think not just from a judicial standpoint, but from a, an economic standpoint and from the standpoint of the, the respect of the citizenry, uh, stare decisis and, and hewing to, to precedent is extremely important. I, I do think that a lot of our uh, economic prosperity is as a result of the consistency and predictability of our laws. Um, people understand what our laws are. The lawyers can predict uh, in, in many instances what a court is going to say because there is precedent that governs it. And, uh, you know, Sandra Day O'Connor used to say, you know, the only, we need courts, but we only need them when people are not obeying the law or when they need to understand what the law is. But by and large, the citizenry understands what the law is because it is consistent and predictable. So to, to overturn precedent, we need to, to say this was, this was wrong. What we said before was wrong. Plessy versus Ferguson, it was wrong. Um, and, uh, you know, there was an argument, I guess it was by Breyer, kind of a, do we need a super uh, view that it's wrong if the case is such an important case that we have depended upon, relied upon, lived with, abided by for decades? Uh, and, you know, there's, maybe there's something to be said for that. There, there is no judicial principle to that effect. But when you think about it, uh, a case, and I think the reliance factor uh, is important. Um, our businesses rely on these laws. Our individuals, for their the way they conduct themselves, rely on laws. So I think stare decisis is, is extremely, extremely important. Uh, and it's interesting. Um, on my court, I'm on the Court of Appeals one step below the Supreme Court, but it's a really, really big step. <laughs> um, Justice Alito, when he was in his confirmation hearings, uh, he was asked about his judicial philosophy, et cetera. And he said, well, you know, it's interesting. On the Court of Appeals, probably 96% of our cases involving the Constitution, there is precedent that if it doesn't directly govern the issue, it certainly points in a certain direction. So he said he had not had to adopt a judicial philosophy. Mm. And I agree with that. We have precedent. Uh, and on my court, uh, I'm now a senior judge, but uh, we have a very, uh, I'd say an even split right now with respect to uh, people who have been uh, nominated by Obama or Clinton versus Trump, Bush. Um, and, and you would say, oh, well, you know, they're going to be divided on a lot of issues. But actually, it's amazing how we are very much in line because there's precedent. And you can say, well, you know, I am more a conservative or liberal. If there's precedent that says this is the way you go, we follow it. That's what we do as judges. So it's easy for us um, to do. And, and it's actually, it makes our job very enjoyable and rewarding to see the judges adhere to the precedent. They may not agree with it. And if there were no precedent, maybe they'd go a different way, but we all have that respect for precedent and for the rule of law. Um, so I think stare decisis, the consistency, the predictability, the reliability factors, I think it's huge. Wow, that's such a fascinating, rich and important answer. Um, Curry reminds us to uh, repeat to define stare decisis. Um, we have some good seventh grade friends in the audience and a lot of good students and friends. Stare decisis in Latin means let the decision stand. And as the judge said, it's generally a idea that if there's clear precedent, then you should adhere to it um, and not change the law. And she just said something very important that taught all of us a lot, which is that for appellate judges who are very important judges, um, but don't sit on the Supreme Court, and for most judges who are not on the Supreme Court, there generally is clear precedent in 96% of the cases. So that leaves much less room for judicial philosophies and for big philosophical disagreements. And as she also said that that's very satisfying because that's a judge's job is to apply the law. So Judge Rendell has just helped us understand that we shouldn't imagine that the most controversial cases on the Supreme Court, like 
whether to overturn Roe v. Wade are what most judges do most of the time. She she told us that most most of the time judges apply precedent and there's often a lot of agreement. We have a question about the jury system. Uh, what is the role of the jury in our system? I recently watched the movie 12 Angry Men and was interested in what kind of limits there are, if any, on how juries can come to their verdict. That is very interesting. Um, I just was doing a uh, program this week involving the uh, trial of William Penn, uh, which the jury there was was asked by the, the, the court, the court was really an arm of the king, to find that William Penn was, uh, he was outside preaching and the, the, the court wanted him to be found guilty of disturbing the peace. Well, the jury said that he was guilty of speaking in a public place and they wouldn't come to the conclusion that he was disturbing the peace. Uh, and they, they were starved and they were shackled and until they would come up with a verdict, which they never did and they were fined. But they're, they're, it, the, a judge will give the jury instructions uh, as to the law. The jury is supposed to find the facts and given the facts, then apply the law that the court instructs. Uh, and that is the role of the jury. Uh, in a criminal case, they have to decide who they believe. They decide, was it eyewitness identification? Did they believe that the person was at the scene? And then they're given instructions on, you know, whatever, whatever crime it was, with maybe possession of a firearm uh, by a felon, something like that. So they, they really do the work of the courts. It's very interesting. We ask, you know, who's the most important person in the courtroom? And everybody says the judge. No, that's wrong. It's the jury. It really is the jury. And I love it when I do mock trials with, with students. I love the juries. I take them out and have them express their views, pros and cons, and they, they, they go through the process like 12 angry men. Um, and they, they adhere to their views. They discuss the cases, uh, they discuss the facts. And, you know, it's, a, it's an interesting process. I actually was on a jury once, which was very interesting. It, it, the case settled, it was a civil case, but it made me realize how important the jury is and how, how they have to take their role seriously and pay attention, not discuss the case before all the evidence is in. Um, but there's very few limits on what, how a jury does comport themselves. Uh, and there can be cases when, uh, you know, people are charged with crimes and juries really don't think that, you know, the law is just, they, they come up with something called jury nullification. Uh, but by and large, I am so impressed with the way juries take their tasks so seriously. They listen to the instructions of the judge. They, they work hard. You know, when you hear about juries deliberating for days, that's because they're working through all the counts. They're working through it. They're, they're, they're discussing it. One person has a view. The other one has, has another view. Um, trying to reach a, a decision that all of them can adhere to. And at the end of the day, when the jury delivers their verdict, very often the, the def defend criminal case will ask that they be polled. And each juror is asked, is this your verdict? And they all say yes, because they worked at it and they came to this decision. Um, if they were to say, if one or more were to say no, then it isn't a unanimous verdict. But uh, juries are very, very important. And it amazes me that people might be very upset when they're picked for a jury because they don't know what it's going to happen. And, you know, one time a juror said, oh, my boss is going to fire me. And I said, will you please give me his phone number? I'm calling him and he's not firing you. Um, mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, after they have deliberated, by and large, they find it to be a very rewarding experience uh, and very valuable. You, you were not judged by just one umpire. We've got 12 people deciding our fate. It's, it's actually a gift. It's actually a gift. Well, that's a wonderful answer too, that j just as you told us that most judges are, are bound by precedent in many cases, you, you, you also said you have optimism in the jury based on your own experience and, and seeing juries decide and deliberate in good faith and that the system really works. What is it, um, if you're, you're telling us that in, in most of the cases, uh, we're talking about federal court uh, cases, um, judges and jurors are able to transcend partisanship and polarization and decide according to the rule of law. Wh wh why is it that the system works uh, in a way that the political branches uh, don't? 
I think because juries understand their role and their task and they do it. They're supposed to observe the witnesses, determine who they believe. Um, they're, they're given a job. They take it seriously. Uh, and, and I guess there's no, there's no incentive to do anything differently. They know they have a purpose. They're part of this system. It's important that they do their job. And their, their incentive is the judge has told us this is what we're going to do. We took an oath and mm. this is what we're going to do. Uh, and I'm wondering actually how many times in a jury room, you know, if someone's acting out, someone says, you know, we took an oath. This is what we're supposed to do. And you're not, you're not acting appropriately. Um, unfortunately, our other branches have incentivization to do things differently. And, and that is called politics. That's called the desire to get reelected. Mm -hmm. uh, that's, that's called, um, you know, maybe some of its ego. I don't know. Mm -hmm. But I think the juror, the incentive of most of these jurors, uh, you know, and ju the jury process of choosing a jury also weeds out those who believe they can't be fair or they have some prior situation. Uh, maybe they've had a, a, a person in their family who has been, uh, you know, sh shot. And this is a, a case having to do with gun violence or something. And if they can't believe they can be fair, they're probably not going to be on the jury. So you end up with 12 people there who have said they believe they can be fair. That's their job. And they've taken an oath. So I think their incentive is to, to do the right thing, um, which is, again, wonderful. And it's interesting when I go in and talk to juries, or I did when I was on the trial court, and they would say, did we get it right? Did we get it right? And I would say, you did a wonderful job. You did your job. Seriously, I'm not going to tell you right or wrong. There is no right or wrong. Your verdict is the, the right verdict according to what you did. Um, but, you know, they want to know whether how I would have decided the case or whatever. Mm. But they're very concerned about did they get it right? And that's mm. that's as it should be. And they realize the responsibility. It's huge. They're deciding someone's fate. If it's a criminal trial, they're deciding a lot, a lot of monetary uh, 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 aspect if it's a civil trial. So they, they take it seriously. That's so fascinating. Did we get it right? And the fact that jurors do try to get it right. And as you said, they don't have incentives that distract them from following their oath. And you identified some of the incentives that the political branches have, like to be reelected or ego or to, you know, get, get approval maybe among certain folks on mm -hmm. social media and not others. Whereas juries, as you put it, and as we're thinking it through together, deliberate. They, they spend time together deliberating, trying to figure out the right answer according to the rule of law. So what other, what, what aspects of the jury system might promote that kind of deliberation elsewhere in society? Jur juries, of course, are literally locked in a room. They deliberate in secret. They're not allowed to talk to other people until they reach a verdict. H how could we take some of those deliberative features and, and transfer them to other aspects of society? Well, well, you mentioned they're locked in a room. I think we, we lock the legislators in a room and until they come to a compromise <laughs> and agree to pass a law and govern, we don't let them out. Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> we, don't, we don't let them talk to the press. We don't let them read the polls. Um, you know, I think it's, it's unrealistic, but it, it's, it's regrettable that, uh, and maybe it's the 24 seven news cycle as much as anything. Um, you know, word passes around in a, in a nanosecond and, uh, and everybody knows what they're thinking and everybody knows the you know, the sound bites. Uh, uh, so they're, they're constantly, you know, testing the polls and taking the temperature of the electorate. Um, and that, they are the legislative branch. They are supposed to do the will of the people. Uh, the courts are not. Uh, years ago, in the situation involving the Chavo situation down in Florida, a senator said, you know, decried what the courts were doing and says, the courts, you know, aren't doing the will of the people, to which I said, well, Senator, that's your job. Um, so obviously, the legislature, they're supposed to do the will of the people, and perhaps they listen a little too much to what what the people and the pundits and everybody are, are saying about what they're doing. Um, uh, you know, when, when Ed Rendell was, was mayor uh, and when he was governor, he, uh, he really adopted a uh, philosophy that, you know, he, he was gonna do the right thing. 
and he didn't care what the people thought. He was going to do the right thing. And if that meant that he wasn't reelected, so be it. Uh, hmm. But but he wasn't going to to look for you know, reelection as as the goal. Uh, he says, if they agree that I did the right thing, then maybe they'll reelect me. If they don't, then maybe they won't. But, you know, I will have done my job. But there aren't many people who adopt that that philosophy in our legislature today. That's that's fascinating too. D- doing the right thing, regardless of whether people like it in the short term. And, and yeah. Governor Rendell was was one of our great mayors, and it's a really instructive lesson for politicians, maybe to take that approach of judges and juries and try to do the right thing and not be swayed by momentary popularity. Very important point. Um, I, I'm going to turn it back to Curry in a sec because, um, but I. Um, we have a question about uh, from Ed uh, Zetig about how do you feel about cameras in the court? And that leads me to note that the, the Biden Supreme Court Commission just issued a long report. They came up with a lot of arguments on both sides of many proposed reforms to the court. They didn't endorse any in particular, but the one they did think would be a good idea would be for the Supreme Court to keep posting its oral arguments in real time, the, the audio and the transcripts, which are constructive. So wh- what, what do you think about that? Should, should we go a step further and have cameras? And um, are, are there other uh, reforms along those lines that you, you, you think might be helpful for the courts? Well, I'm not a proponent of cameras in uh, the, the courtroom. Um, I, I think, unfortunately, it would lead to getting snapshots, uh, you know, pieces of pictures here and there. And, you know, a, a trial or even an argument is a, is a continuum, especially a trial. Um, the populace has no idea what has gone on behind the scenes before the trial. Motions of what can be heard, what can't be heard. Um, there's just a lot of evidentiary things that are, are gonna make people critical of what happens in the courtroom without really understanding what is happening and, and what the confines are and why there are, there are certain rules as to what you can and can't do. Um, you know, the O.J. Simpson trial, you know, comes to mind that just, you know, was, it, it was a stage show. Uh, and that's my fear too. Uh, judges are people too, playing to the, playing to the camera, um, you know, I think is a, is a human characteristic that, you know, could happen. I don't think it would better the understanding of the courts uh, that much. Um, we have nothing to hide, but I just don't think there's a general understanding of, of what goes on and why it goes on. Uh, I do love the audio arguments of the Supreme Court. They're well done. And the way the chief calls on different justices, I think is so far superior to the, you know, everybody jumping in that happens when you have oral arguments that are, are live. Uh, and I know even in our court, when we, during the pandemic, did our arguments via Zoom, it was much more orderly because in Zoom, if you're not interrupting constantly, you, you lose a lot of the continuity. Uh, whereas if you're in the courtroom and I'm on the bench and I see the, the lawyer finishing up a thought, I'm gonna jump in and the other judge might jump. And we tend not to listen as well. I think on the Zoom arguments, and I think uh, when it's more orderly, you as a, I as a jurist, I listen more intently uh, and, and formulate my question perhaps better uh, and think about it before I ask my question. So I do think that the audio is great. Uh, I'm just not a, I just think there are too many downsides to cameras in the courtroom compared to the upsides. That's so interesting and important too, and it fits in very much with your answers about uh, precedent and the way juries work. Um, we want to create structures for thoughtful deliberation, and you say that the audio oral arguments do that, and Zoom can do that, but cameras just might be distracting and give people a mistaken impression of what the courts actually do and discourage the deliberation that is crucial to the rule of law. What wonderful and inspiring discussion. And as uh, much as I'd love to continue, now is the time for me to turn it back over to Curry for some final questions from our friends. Uh, so that is fantastic and leads right into the first question, which was really where we started with the court le- court's legitimacy. So, you know, sometimes you get the suggestion of maybe we should have cameras in the courtroom so people can see what actually goes on there so they believe in the system more. 
Um, but like you said, that can cause a downside too. So what are other suggestions to, to ensure that the public understands how the court works and is invested in it? My government class in high school, we, were, we had to go to a court. Uh, court hearing. Our teacher schlepped us all there and had us go through the entire thing so we could see the whole process in person. But do you have any other suggestions about how the public can feel a part of the court system? Uh, serving on a jury was a great one earlier too. That was fantastic. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, our court houses are, are open. People can go in and sit in a courtroom. You could spend all day going from courtroom to courtroom, observing uh, different proceedings. Now, again, these are gonna be snapshots. You're not gonna get the full continuum. Uh, and if you come into our court hearing an argument, just like with the Supreme Court, sometimes the, the level of discourse, uh, it's such a fine point of, you know, an issue about standing, an issue about, uh, you know, pre-enforcement challenge, an, an issue about, uh, you know, an, an esoteric part of the law. Maybe you're not going to fully understand. In fact, sometimes, I look forward to a Supreme Court argument thinking I'm gonna really hear about something I wanna hear about the case and the court goes off in a totally different direction and I judge familiar with the case, I'm lost. So I think there's, there's, a, there's a problem there. Um, but I do think that we as, as, as judges and, and justices um, can, be, can be clear in our opinions so that when the journalists journalists who are so challenged. You know, we don't have journalists who are assigned to the courts anymore. Um, a journalist uh, is, is assigned to six different things and it has a 6 p.m. deadline. Uh, they need, to, need us to help them understand what the case is about. Uh, and I think we could be clearer in the opening parts of our opinions to lay out exactly why we're deciding a case so that it can be reported correctly and the, and the people can understand what, what we're doing and, and why we're doing it. Um, so I think you know, we, we can have a role in that. Uh, I'm not sure at the Supreme Court whether that's so easy. I mean, their opinions are so long and uh, very, very, uh, not technical, but complex, necessarily complex. Um, but I think we could, you know, we as judges could be uh, better in our opinions and I wish people would ask us to come uh, to, the, to their classroom. Uh, judges love to do this. Teachers, I think, are surprised that we would be willing to do this. They don't know how to do it. Well, they could call the Bar Association. They could call the court's clerk's office and say, for Law, law Day or Bill of Rights Day, I'd love a judge to come speak to an assembly or to, to do Q&A or just chat with a group. Um, that would be a great way uh, you know, for for, for people to have access and understand the courts better. So I, I'm sending a shout out to all the teachers out there. Please um, call the court clerk and say, you know, Bill of Rights Day is coming up, Law Day is coming up, or this Friday we have an assembly. We'd like a judge come and talk, talk to us about a certain case, talk to us about what they do, talk to us about careers in the law. Um, judges love to do that. We, we really do. We go over and we do, we give chats at the National Constitution Center when a class is coming in and we spend an hour and the students have questions and uh, we, we answer the questions as best we can. And it, it creates an understanding. Uh, you know, in the courtroom, we're sitting up there above it all. We wanna be down with the people. We wanna be talking to students and telling them about what we do. We, we just, uh, we're not sure about how to access the opportunity and sometimes teachers aren't, but I'm, I'm telling you, please call, call your court clerk and say, uh, I'd like, I'd like a judge to come into our school or we'd like the school to come into the, the courthouse. Um, and we are, we are now adopting a policy in our, in our court in the third circuit, um, wanting to open our courthouses. Now it's a tough time because of security, but we're, we're going to have a, we're hoping to have an essay contest where the winning classes can come into the courthouse, bring parents, kids and spend a day and, uh, you know, open the doors of the courthouse and, have people better understand. So that would be an idea that I would have. And I think you're an unbelievable ambassador for the courts. And if any teacher is out there and wants to get connected, we will help you too, um, because we love working with your court system and you're just all so amazing. One final question about careers. Um, I know the students when you're here always ask you about how you became a judge and kind of what you what got you into being in the courts. 
But they also, uh, Colin wanted to know, do you use clerks? And how does that process work? I think he's thinking of a future career as well. <laughs> okay, let's hear it. Become, become a law clerk. Um, <laughs> yes, we have, we have so much work uh, and it involves research. It involves reading briefs and really delving into a lot of material that, I mean, if I didn't sleep at night, I still couldn't get through myself. So we have law clerks um, and they are uh, usually uh, law students who have just completed law school. Now, college is four years, law school is three years. So coming out of law school, uh, they will send in their resume and recommendations from law professors uh, to different judges. Uh, and there are career counselors in, in the law schools can help you uh, decide where you should apply to be a law clerk. Now, there are hundreds of applications that we get uh, for, for law clerk positions. Um, and different people have you know, different reasons why they choose different law clerks. I, I usually have recommendations from professors of people that, that are come highly recommended to me. Um, I never was a law clerk. It wasn't as fashionable or as uh, prevalent as it, as it is today when I went to law school. Uh, and yet I wish I had because uh, the experience, uh, it's wonderful. We, we work one-on-one -on -one with our law clerks. Uh, they do research, we interact with them. We, we help them with their writing. Uh, they help us write opinions, uh, just invaluable. Uh, and, and wonderful relationship. I think that's one thing that keeps me still going to work is the fact that every year, uh, these are usually just a one year, uh, although I have one permanent law clerk, um, but usually one year and to have new fresh mind come in every year, uh, someone that I can work with and, and maybe help in terms of uh, writing or thought process and help me. Um, I love the fact that I just have these new young people uh, every year who, who just provide uh, such support uh, in, in every way. Uh, and I say we're, we're either like four law clerks or four judges. Uh, we all work on the cases and I'll take some of them, they'll take some of them and we, we do a collaborative effort. So it's, it's great, but, uh, but it is a lot of work. You have to do well in law school. And, uh, but you know, it's not rocket science. I was a French major in college. What does that have to do with anything? Then I decided to go to law school and and I did fine. And then I decided to be in a law firm and I did fine and, you know, got up every morning and, and worked hard. And that's, it's something that you can do. You really can do if you apply yourself. Uh, it's, it's within your reach if you want it and you're willing to work hard. We cannot thank you enough. You are just an unbelievable ambassador to the courts and to judges. You make everything feel so attainable and comfortable. And you really do talk about the teams, the teams that go into understanding the law, the teams that go into the court cases, the teams that go into the juries. And that's so refreshing and so enlightening. And I love the way that you broke down the job of the, the, the judge is to read, is to listen, is to write, and it's to follow the law and read, understand the law. So I just, I really appreciate you so much, how you break it down for all of us and how it feels accessible and attainable for a career for so many students out there. So thank you so much for all of us. It's been a wonderful Friday session. Then we'll turn it over to you to wrap it all up, but I'm ready to be a judge now. Well, <laughs> thank you. I love working with you all at the National Constitution Center. We have such a great time and we, we, try to, we try to get it right. We try to make sure people understand what we're doing, their rights and responsibilities. It's so rewarding to have such partners as you, Jeff, and you, Curry. And as soon as we get off here, I'm going to go read about what the Supreme Court did with the pre-enforcement challenge this morning. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, I, I couldn't have said it better than, than Curry. And, and we're so fortunate to work with you and to have the benefit of all of your learning and light and, and inspiration. And thank you for inspiring all of our great students and all of us to, to be the best students of the Constitution that we possibly can be. Thank you, Judge, for all your wonderful work. Thank you Have so much. Weekend. I appreciate it. Thank you, teachers, students, everyone out there. Bye. Have Thank a great you. day. Bye. Thank you so much. Bye. Lots of thank yous going on everywhere. <laughs>